Hello, hello, this is Carl Sussman. This is Insurance Hour. Thank you so much for being here and learning about your insurance, learning how to use it, learning how to save money, learning how to file claims. You are just learning everything insurance related. We've been going through listener emails today. If you've missed any of them, there have been some really good ones, then please go back and listen again. You can find us as a podcast. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on iHeartMedia. You can find us pretty much everywhere. Just jump online, search for Insurance Hour. You can even go to insurancehour.com and find all that information there as well. Remember also, you can reach out to me directly at 559-656-0317. And of course, you can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. Alrighty, we are moving right along. We are mowing through the insurance questions that came in. Here's the next one. Insurance companies make money by not paying claims. How is that not a conflict of interest? That's a tough one. So let's talk about it. Does an insurance company make money by not paying claims? Hmm. Well, I I suppose in a vacuum, again, all things remaining the same, if you had two exact insurance companies, with the identical client and the identical policy and the identical claim, if one would not pay a claim and one would pay a claim, then theoretically the company that did not pay the claim would have had less of an expense. But listen to what we just said. If it's the same company, if it's the same insured, if it's the same coverage, the same policy, then they would pay the same. Well, they, if one pays, they would both pay. But we we're saying it's the same policy. So yes, I suppose if a, co- if a company does not pay a claim, they're not paying that claim. But if they're not supposed to pay the claim, then, then none of the carriers would pay that claim. You follow what I'm saying? Insurance carriers are contracts. The, the contract you purchase from an insurance company is a contract. It's a legally binding document. Not an attorney, disclosure, disclosure but it's a binding agreement. It's a promise between you and the insurance company. You promise to pay premium, and in exchange, they promise to pay a claim in the event you need one. And insurance policies, they say, are must be created and and you might you must use them with the utmost good faith, okay? Which basically translates into, let's give everyone the benefit of the doubt, right? So. To say that an insurance company makes money by not paying claims, dollars and cents wise might be true, but there's an implication that they would be in that they would be intentionally denying a claim that they should be paying because they want to make money. And that's the part that's not true. Insurance carriers, again, and we're talking in general, of course there are bad apples, of course there's fraud, of course there's all that stuff that goes on. There's fraud on insurance carriers, there's fraud on insurance clients. We're all people, unfortunately. You're going to see that on both sides of the spectrum if you look hard enough. My point is that an insurance carrier would love to just adhere to their exact policy, word for word. Not the spirit of the policy, just the policy. Because that's what they have actuarially put together. That's what they've decided they need X dollars in premium for. What happens is when we get into that gray area, when we get into that, well, it's saying this, but does it mean that? And if we're working based on the utmost good faith, shouldn't it pay that? The last thing that a carrier wants is to have to pay for a claim that's not in the policy. That breaks the system, right? Because the system says the insurance carrier will determine what the risk will cost them. The client decides if that's worth paying the money. If they do, They shake hands, if it were only that simple, and they have an agreement and they have a policy and they have a a document that keeps them on track. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Not all policies are created equal. And what ends up happening is as people might move from one company to another, one policy to another, one state to another, and these policies are different, they might find themselves in a situation where they thought there's coverage and there's not. And that doesn't necessarily, in my mind anyway, equate to an insurance carrier intentionally trying to deny coverage so it can make more money. Hopefully that makes sense. Not trying to justify anything. Like I said, carriers are carriers. It's not personal. They wanna follow the policies. And as consumers, we just wanna follow the policies. And if it turns out that you file a claim and that claim does not fit within the policy language, then you shouldn't expect to get paid even though you might want to, right? And the insurance carrier certainly is not going to want to pay if it doesn't have to. All right, next question. 
Why do people buy life insurance on babies? Ugh. This is a hard one. This really is a hard one. All right, let's talk about why people purchase life insurance to begin with, all right? Now, the, the most general idea to purchase life insurance is to replace the income you generated, right? If you are working and you're making money and you are no longer alive, we assume then you are not working and you are not making money. So life insurance is there to replace that income to somebody that is depending on that income. We can agree on that, right? Now, there are various other sundry reasons that people might purchase life insurance, but as a general rule, that's the crux of it. It's to replace your income generation. Now, then you say, all right, well, then why would somebody buy life insurance on a baby? And I'll answer you, there actually is a reason. There's something called insurability. When a baby is born, oh, they're fresh. And they, hopefully, if all is well, they don't have any major health issues. They're not overweight. Although I might have seen some that might have been. And you know who you are if you're listening. But for the most part, they're healthy, let's assume. If you purchase a life insurance policy on a newborn, you are taking that fact that they are healthy, as healthy as healthy can be, the best health rating, and you're locking it in. If you purchase a permanent life insurance policy on a baby, you can take that low exposure, that healthiest of healthiness, and lock it in, depending on the policy, for the rest of the baby's life. So what happens if when that child is a teenager, they develop diabetes? What if they develop kidney disease? What if they get cancer? Well, they can't get insurance at that point because they have these significant health issues. So what are they going to do? Well, if they had a policy purchased on them when they were first born, not only do they already have an insurance policy, they have a preferred policy. Remember we said the best price, the best health rating, they already have it. So to answer the question, the only reason that I can personally think of, and I'm sure there are more, and I know that people that sell a lot of life insurance, they probably could write books on this. I'm just giving you my, my take on this. The primary reason that somebody would buy life insurance on a child would be to protect their insurability. Meaning you wanna have insurance in place for them because they might not need it today, but when they get older, they get married, they have kids of their own, they're, they're generating income. What if they're uninsurable? What if something happens and they can't purchase a policy? You're, in essence, you're taking out an insurance policy on getting, getting an insurance policy by purchasing something when they're younger. And on that note, because that sounds funny as heck, let's take our last break for the day. And when we're back, we'll go through the rest of the questions. Thanks for watching. If you found this useful, please be sure to like and subscribe for more content. And don't forget, click here to watch the next video.